Hi everybody, uh, today's problem is I want to look at what force is required to pull a wheel over a curb that has a height H. Uh, my wheel has a mass M, it has a radius R which is bigger than the curb, and I'm going to apply a horizontal force and that force is being applied as shown in the figure here right at the center of the wheel. So let's see how we can set up a problem like this and see how we can calculate what is the minimum force to get this wheel to rotate and basically get on top of the curb. I can then ask a follow-up question. What if the force is not being applied at the center, but at the top? Is it easier? Do I require more force or less force if I apply a force at the top of the wheel versus the midpoint? So let's go ahead and set this problem up, look at the forces, and calculate what we need. All right, so here's our problem. We have a wheel, it has a radius r, and we have a curve of a height h. I'm applying this horizontal force here to the right. Now the wheel has a mass m. Uh, if it has a mass m, that means there's a weight, and I'll put the weight acting at the center of mass, right at the center of the wheel. The magnitude of that force is mg. All right, other forces acting on the system. Well, the wheel also comes in contact here with the corner of the curb. Therefore, there has to be some contact force. I'm not sure which direction it's in, but I'm going to write it like this as FC. Now, you might be tempted to write a normal force down here. However, we're going to consider the case where the wheel is just starting to go, just slightly above the surface. And if it's no longer in contact with the surface, uh, there's no more normal force uh, acting on the wheel from this bottom surface. So these are the three forces that we're interested in. And now we want to calculate the torque due to each one of those. So the torque due to any force, well, we need a couple things. We need a vector, or the, we need to know the length of the vector that goes from the pivot all the way to where the force is being applied. And the magnitude of that vector is, is written as little r. We need the magnitude of the force, and now we also need to know the angle between our vector r and the force f. And that's how you calculate the torque. So that means there's an immediate simplification because look at where the pivot is for this system. The pivot for this system here is right here, right at the edge of the curb. And we have a force, Fc, that acts right at the edge of the curb. Therefore, we can immediately conclude that the force, due to this contact force, since this distance here, r, is zero, there is no torque produced by that force. Okay, because it's acting right at the pivot. So now we're really left with the torque due to two forces, our applied force and also the weight. So to simplify this, let me actually just eliminate this one from the diagram just to clean it up because we've already convinced ourselves that it doesn't produce any torque. This distance over here, well, think about it. If this is the radius r, this curb here is a height h, that means that this distance, whatever's left over here, must be r minus h. And the reason this is <laughs> kind of the simplest method of calculating the torque is remember I can write this as simply the force multiplied by the shortest distance from the pivot all the way to the line of action of the force. And for this particular case, that shortest distance from the pivot right here to the line of action of the force is simply this one. See here, this makes a right angle with respect to the line of action of the force. So right away, you should be able to write that the torque Let's make that a little bit smaller. Uh, you should be able to write that the torque due to this applied force F um, is simply the magnitude of the force and multiplied by R minus H. And again, this is going to be a torque in the clockwise direction, so let's just mark it like this in brackets. All right, now the next one is the torque due to the weight. Uh, the torque due to the weight, again, I'm going to use the same kind of method here. The torque due to the weight can be simply calculated by finding this distance right here. This here is the shortest distance from our pivot here all the way to the line of action of the force. And I'm going to call this distance x. Imagine a line going from the pivot all the way to the line of action of the force. This here is the shortest distance. <laughs> so how do we calculate that distance x? Well, for this, you have to picture this triangle. Right, you have a line that goes from the pivot to the center of the wheel. The length of that line is r, so let's do that. What else? Well, you also know the height here. You know the length of this side. That is simply r minus h. And then we're left with our distance x, which is this one. 
So right away, you should be able to write, just use Pythagorean here, that x should be equal to square root of r squared minus r minus h squared. Now, if I expand the term in the bracket over here, you're going to be left with x is simply equal to the square root of, well, those r squareds are going to cancel. Uh, you're going to be left with minus 2rh here, but then that's going to switch signs. So you're going to be left with 2rh and then minus h squared like this. Okay, so right away then I should be able to write the torque due to the weight as being the magnitude of the force mg multiplied by this perpendicular distance, the shortest distance between the pivot and the line of action of the force. Uh, let's just use the square root symbol over here. I'll clean this up. So we're left with 2r h minus h squared. And again, this torque over here, this here is going to be in the counterclockwise direction. Because if it's the only force acting on it, it would tend to make it rotate um, in the counterclockwise direction. So as long as the torque produced by this force is slightly bigger than the torque produced by the weight, you're going to have a net torque in the clockwise direction. So let's find the condition for which the two torques are the same. You simply set both of these expressions equal to each other. And when they're the same, the object's in equilibrium. For any force bigger than that, there's going to be a net torque acting in the clockwise direction. So at the end, that simply means that um, our force F multiplied by R minus H, that's the torque due to this one. Once this is equal to mg, square root of, again, 2R, h minus h squared. That is our condition for equilibrium. So at the end, we get that our force F is simply equal to the weight. And then you get this kind of rather complicated expression here. Uh, 2rh minus h squared uh, divided by r minus h. I always like to take limits when I'm left with this kind of messy algebraic expression like this. What happens in the limit that h equals to zero? Check it out. What happens when h equals to zero? Look at the term under the square root. This term will be zero, the next term will be zero. I don't have to worry about any division by zero here. So at the end, really, you're gonna find that the force needed to roll over a curb that is basically not there because the height is zero equals to zero. Hey, look at that. <laughs> that makes sense. There is no force required. <laughs> Take another limit. What happens now if the height of the curb equals to the radius of the wheel? Think about it for a minute. All right, if, you, if I increase the height of this curb here all the way to where this force is being applied, right, think about why it would begin to rotate. All right, in this case, it doesn't matter what the horizontal force is. You're not going to be able to get this wheel on top of the curb if it has a height equal to the radius of the wheel. And if you look at our expression over here, imagine that the height h equals to r, or it's very close to r. Look what happens here. I'm going to be dividing by zero or a very, very small term. And if I divide by a small term, that means that the force is going to tend to be very, very big. So in that limit where h equals to r, the force is going to be infinite. So kind of a nice little problem. All right, so here's part two of my problem. Part two, I want to say, well, what happens now if I apply my force not at the center? I'm still going to apply it in the horizontal direction, except now I'm going to apply it at the top edge of this wheel. What is the minimum force required in order to get this wheel up on top of the curb? All right, so again, we still have the weight, right? That hasn't changed. Our weight is still acting down. It still has a magnitude mg. And now we have this force F again. I could also put our contact force between the uh, edge of the curb and uh, the wheel. However, we know that that force doesn't produce any torque. So we only want to consider both of these. Now, the torque due to the weight, that really hasn't changed. I haven't changed the weight. Therefore, the force is still like that. And now the shortest distance between the weight... <laughs> and the pivot point, which is here. So this shortest distance also hasn't changed. I had called that x previously. So therefore, I can calculate the torque right away and just write down the same expression as I previously had. 
So this was 2RH minus H squared. And remember, this is the calculation I had for the distance X. All right, so now what is the torque due to my applied force in this case? Well, the applied force has a magnitude F. Now, what is the distance to the pivot in this case? Well, think about it. If this here is a distance R, if I go up to the diameter of the wheel, that's two times the radius, and take away this distance H, right? Because this is really the distance I'm trying to calculate here. All right, this is the shortest distance between the pivot and the line of action of the force. So right away, I think I could simply write that down as 2R minus H. And again, you can now calculate the condition. When are the torques going to be equal in magnitude? They're in opposite directions. One of them tends to rotate the wheel clockwise, the other counterclockwise. So we, we're going to get our expression for the force. Again, it's going to be similar to the previous case. Uh, 2RH minus H squared. And now, except the only difference here is the denominator term, which is 2 times R minus H. So there are some differences in this equation, right? This denominator term, there's this extra 2 here. So what does that mean? Remember that limit I took there. What happens if the height equals to the radius of the wheel? I, in the previous case, I wasn't able to actually produce enough torque, right? I would have to apply basically an infinite force in order to accomplish that. In this case, that's no longer a problem now because my, my force F um, is much farther away than the previous case. So the expression is a little bit different. This means that the force in this case, in part two, is definitely going to be smaller than uh, the force required for the first part, part one. Okay. Because this force provides much more torque than in the previous case because the line of action is much farther away from uh, the pivot point in this case. All right, there you have it, folks. That's the bicycle wheel um, over the curb. Hope you liked the video. Hope you learned something. If you like the channel, please consider subscribing. If you have any questions or comment, don't hesitate to uh, leave them below, and I'll try to help you out.